Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation on installing and flying with the AeroNav Navigators from Bendix King. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm president of Social Flight. For those of you joining us for the first time, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. Visit socialflight.com or download the Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices, and that will give you free access to over 10,000 aviation events, destinations, and airport restaurants. You'll even get a weekly email with a list of all of the aviation events happening in your local area. Our mission is to give pilots like you more reasons to get out there and fly. Now, in addition to events you can fly to, we also have online events, which is why we're here this evening. Now, before we get started, just a few tips. First of all, a recording of tonight's presentation will be available on socialflight.com and on our Social Flight YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. It takes a little time to process it, and then it will be up there for you. Now, there is also a Q&A feature here in the webinar. If you can post questions there, we will do our best to integrate some of those into our presentation as those questions come in. But most importantly, the staff at Bendix King will directly connect with you on your questions following the webinar. So it may take a, a day or two to get everybody uh, taken care of on their questions, but rest assured that when you post a question, uh, both uh, your information as well as your question come through, and all of that will go to Bendix King. We'll make sure that uh, you get your questions answered. So let's get started. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your speakers tonight. You have myself and you have Stephen Pierce. Um, Quick uh, background just on me. Uh, I uh, have been in the avionics industry now for quite some time, a couple decades, uh, AMP and IA mechanic, uh, pilot and aircraft owner. Um, uh, if you read the, the AOPA online column, then you uh, may have stumbled across one of my articles there on owner-assisted maintenance. My real mission in life is to help people own aircraft, to make it as uh, accessible as possible, and to make you educated owners in every way that I can help. And that includes avionics, as we're going to talk about tonight. My personal experience does include creating and holding SDCs and PMA on a number of products in aviation. And uh, my day job really is social flight. And that's uh, what we've talked about here. And a quick note at the end, if you were to look behind me right now here, in Marlboro, Massachusetts, you would see an aircraft right behind me inside our house, and you may want to check that out as well because we are building a T-51D Mustang here with uh, my boys at Team Social Flight in our living room. So a little bit of color on where I'm coming from, uh, but my background in the avionics industry really has me interested in what Bendix King is doing now. And also, truth be told, if you go back uh, qu quite a number of years, uh, I actually used to be at Bendix King. So it's a very uh, interesting reunion, and I really enjoy seeing all the uh, exciting things that the company is doing. And I'm joined this evening by Stephen Pierce. Stephen, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so just a quick introduction about myself, uh, UND graduate, uh, major in aviation technology management, uh, moved from the great white north of North Dakota uh, down to Albuquerque working for Bendix King. Been there since 2016 and really do truly enjoy um, the company and the culture. Um, you may have interacted with me on Beach Talk or Pilots of America, uh, so I'm Bendix King's voice. Um, on both those pilot forms. I've written a couple articles as well uh, for AvBuyer and GA Buyer, uh, and an Avid Pilot. Uh, so I do hold a commercial uh, instrument rating as well, uh, multi-engine uh, coming from UND. So excited overall um, to talk to you about the AeroNav products. Uh, so I am product marketing manager for those, and so I'm excited to just kind of share some of that passion uh, with you today. Thanks so much, Stephen. So let's get started with, you know, what are the AeroNav products? And Stephen and I wanted to talk to you together about this, uh, both from the inside perspective, from where he's coming from at Bendix King, as well as from, you know, my impressions and spending some time and, and learning their strategy about this. Now, first and foremost, you know, let's, let's cut to the chase. These products are based on a partnership with Avidyne, the Avidyne IFD units. And the real question, of course, uh, you know, which I had and I'm sure all of you had, is why and and all the things that come with it. Why, uh, why Bendix King? Why 
you know, a partner with uh, Avidyne on their products with Bendix King Names. And as, as skeptical as I may have been when I first approached this, I really started to understand what this strategy is, and it is an exciting one. Because I am a huge fan as an aircraft owner, as an industry person, in best of breed products. I mean, there are so many companies out there, and getting to look around and see what is, what is the best primary display to be in front of me? What's the best navigator for safety and for functionality? What's the best autopilot? What's the best engine monitor? All of these things, I want the freedom as an aircraft owner to choose what I like and have it all work together and uh, not be beholden just to a single company. And I'm a big believer in that. And once I understood that the strategy here at Bendix King now is to partner with these companies and build a suite of products that all feed in to the uh, AeroView Touch and have a central point of control and really bring everyone together so that we can talk about features, new features and functionality that make sense, that make all the products work the best together with one centralized company with the heritage that Bendix King has to organize this. I really think that they're onto something and that's why I stood behind coming up this evening and uh, and really talking about this. Um, so, um, Stephen, why don't you speak from obviously from the company's perspective? But that's really where I'm coming from. Absolutely, Jeff. And no, you're 100 percent right. Uh, from a company perspective, our goal is not to alienate any companies or anything like that. Uh, we want to foster that sort of open integration so we can move forward with, just like Jeff said, that best of breed mentality. Pull in folks from across the industry and start creating some tighter integrations in between our products and not just relying on you know, one or two companies to provide you know, your entire panel, but giving you the option to choose in between, you know, if you want a different sort of engine monitor, if you want a different EFA system, if you want a different navigator, if you want a different transponder, somehow being able to bring that sort of mentality in and have all of that integrate in a really proper and very tight way. But when it comes to our partnership with Abedine specifically, um, we are obviously looking at how we were going to you know, work towards the next generation of navigators. And uh, we have our AeroView Touch display. And so when we think about that, the partnership with Abedine made a lot of sense for us because Abedine makes great navigators. There is absolutely no question about that. And we're really happy and our display is fantastic. And so that marriage of navigator and display moving towards a very tighter integration within our products seemed like a very logical step for us when moving forward with a GPS navigator. And so that's really the basis between that partnership with Avidine. But now the real question is, what's the difference in between their products and ours? And as of right now, not a whole lot. Um, now that will change as we move forward with our partnership and things along those lines. We are going to work to build integration on our side that's going to work from the Bendix King AeroNav point of view, that's going to work with the Bendix King architecture, and we're going to build that up. But you're also going to see the benefit of that partnership, even if you have an IFD already. For example, we're working on tighter integration currently with Avidyne for our RDR radars. So if you have an RDR 2000 or you've upgraded to a 2060 or you've purchased a brand new one, a 2100, you're going to start to see better integration with the IFD and the AeroNav series for that radar suite. That's something that's going to happen potentially even this year, but we are working on that currently. So seeing that sort of stuff that's going on right now is a great basis for what we're able to do in the future. And the future of that is really the concept cockpit, which is the Bendix King integrated flight deck. And that's ultimately what we're working towards. And so this is a photo of the, the concept that we're going towards is three screens, very modular architecture. You get to choose 
what you want. You want one screen to start with, you want two screens to start with. Maybe you want to go the full Monty and go for an entire three, um, but by having that, you have multiple sets of sensors, so you have up to a triple redundancy across the platform, and you have the navigators, whether or not you want a dual navigator installation or something along those lines, but you see here the AeroNav 800s at the bottom, followed by an autopilot, the AeroCruise 230, and then an audio panel and a transponder. Ultimately, the goal is to have all of that center stack integrated behind the panel. So you can, you don't have to worry about knobs or fumbling around with something that may not be in your primary field of view. You're gonna be able to access all that navigator information directly from your PFD. You need to tune a frequency. PFD. You need to change something in your flight plan that's gonna be driven through your navigator. We're gonna be able to integrate with that with PFD. We wouldn't be able to do that unless we had these sort of partnerships to move forward to really create that future thought process when we're creating a cockpit that's not meant for now, but meant for the future and to be able to integrate future products with things like that. So overall, from a company perspective, that's what we're trying to do as more of an in inclusive mentality um, to bring in all those best of breed that you may already have in your cockpit and create tighter integrations between them. Yeah, and that, that, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense because, you, you know, you can walk around a show like AirVenture or something like that and see all these different products and, and see what you, you know, who's performing best in all these different areas. But ultimately, we're all best served if we can find a way for everybody to work together. And that has to happen in, it really, or could happen in one of two ways. It can happen by putting everyone from all of these companies in, in one, you know, one room as just kind of partners trying to make sure that they work together on their own. But that doesn't always happen. And with this approach with Bendix King's philosophy, having them essentially be the partner and the lead partner for all these other companies, you guys get, to, uh, Stephen, to basically kind of say, look, we need it all to work together, and here's how we need it to work together. And and since they're all working together, these are the features we need, or here's how it integrates, as you mentioned, with radar and some of the other key systems that come from Benix King. So I do think that the industry as a whole is is very well served by essentially having a ringleader bring this in and and get everyone on the same page on a panel that is succinct like this um, as a real viable option. Absolutely. No, and that's exactly kind of what we're moving towards. And, um, you know, it's uh, just going to be you know, seeing how things go. But uh, as of right now, uh, with the Avidine partnership, things are, um, like I said, going really well, uh, spearheading along with the radar. So I'm um, looking forward to kind of digging in and showing you guys some of the additional features of the AeroNav units. So we'll talk a little bit about installation. Now, um, I can speak to this because I've, I've done it, and I've done it in a situation that had both the, the larger and smaller units there uh, uh, and exactly the setup that you see in, in front of you. Uh, certainly, one of the key advantages here is if you already happen to have uh, a 430 or 530 in there, then you're talking a slide-in replacement with uh, some basic settings, and, and you're good to go. And that's something we've heard about for a while, right? And, and is, is just, just a no-brainer because the cost of avionics installation, the labor involved, and all of the other gremlins that show up when you start tearing a panel apart, um, that can be a, a huge, huge portion of, of a panel redo. That said, even if it's a fresh install, I have always been uh, you know, a fan of this size and, and, and format, and that's why they're in my plane. Um, I happen to like the idea of having the redundancy of having the two screens there, but with these units now, the you, you get the hard button controls, but you also get a much larger screen than you had with the previous 530 or 430s, and that that matters a lot. As an installer, uh, the one of the most important things is that you have options. There, you know, whether it's your air data or whether it's, um, you know, a primary flight display, air data, controls, transponder, traffic, weather, whatever's going on, these units have 
a variety of options for the installer. Sometimes the data comes in over RS-232. Sometimes the, you, you choose to do something over 429 or 422 instead of RS-232. Now, that's obviously, you, you know, have to be really familiar with the technology on that to be, to understand kind of why or why I'm saying that. But what it really boils down to is it gives you different options. It means that if you're going in there and the, air data can come over one or both, you can go with whichever one your plane's already wired for. I think that's the key, is whatever is already in there or whatever makes sense or however many ports your system has, instead of your avionics shop coming to you and telling you about the problems of why something has to be completely changed, these units have options that allow you to really fit what your aircraft already has and fit the equipment that you have chosen to, to uh, integrate these with. And you only have to feed most of the data into one of them if you have a two uh, unit setup because of the cross-fill functionality for data. So you make one essentially the master, feed all of everything into that and it automatically comes through to the second one with only two wires between the two that make that happen. Uh, in my case, I'll give you an example of that. For quite a while, I had it set up so I, my uh, ADSB transponder had ADSB weather and traffic on the top unit and on the main unit. And yet, I had XM weather, satellite weather, on my lower unit. Now, the way the, they're, they're actually intelligent units, that what I did is I brought in the weather to the smaller unit from satellite. I brought in the uh, the uh, ADSB to the upper unit, and if you think about it this way, the upper unit sends to the lower unit everything. Here's my flight plan. Here's my data. Here's some traffic. Here's some weather. Well, when it sends the weather, the lower unit says, "Oh, excuse me, I don't need that one. I already have my own weather, thanks." And then it automatically replaces it with whatever it has on its own. Now, all I had to do was go turn that off when I decided to leave and stop using subscription weather, and I do one setting, I turn it off, and now the bottom unit says, oh, I don't have my own. I'll just take it from the top unit now. And boom, it was that quick. And so really reduced wiring, really reduced complexity, and a lot of functionality uh, in terms of uh, the, there's pretty much nothing you can't integrate with. So it, it's been really uh, good to fly with these, and I've flown them for quite a while. Talk also about, I mentioned about, you know, the hybrid touch concept. Um, this, I, I'm also a, a really huge fan of having options for how you control your units here. Um, you can control just about every feature by the touch screen, if that's what you'd like to do. You can control every feature through the hard buttons, if that's what you would like to do. There's even a remote keyboard and, of course, an app that goes along with it. And so the options are really impressive as to how you can choose to control things. And uh, the hard buttons, as you can see, labeled go around there, and each person essentially sees a different way that they feel comfortable performing all the different functions. Um, I have found having different people fly right seat with me that um, each one that, that flies there and has their own job of putting in you know, navigation and communication changes, they all do it differently. Some use hard buttons, some use the touch screen, so, uh, and, and here you have all those options. I am not a fan of only having touch screen as an entry. Um, I really like that, that there's different things for different roles. And I will tell you also in the Mustang that we're building, one of the really cool features is using the app, we can actually have it so that it essentially, the rear passenger has an iPad and the entire navigator is essentially a repeater back there, meaning that the rear seat passenger can load in uh, navigation approaches, change frequencies. Now, of course, you don't want to do that unless it's someone you trust. <laughs> but in our case, uh, we work as a team. And with uh, both my, my sons and when we fly with that, it's going to make it very, very simple to have the rear seat passenger take over some of the navigation duties uh, for, the, uh, for the pilot in the front. So 
very, very cool functionality. And the other thing I'll mention here, and we'll talk more when we when we do a demo. Across the bottom, you have the uh, the FMS, the map, and the auxiliary, and then on the larger unit of the 910, there's also an SVS button. Those are uh, actually uh, very interesting buttons because they're actually rockers. So you actually push to the functionality you want, and then you actually push on either side of that to go back and forth through the tabs, through the pages that you need. So it's extremely flat navigation, meaning you don't get deep into any menus. Very, very simple. Very, very obvious uh, as to how you can get things done. And that's all made possible by the ability of having hard buttons go along with the touch. Absolutely, Jeff. And just to uh, kind of add on to that for one more piece there, if you do have a dual navigator set up like we showed on the uh, previous slide, you can actually use your bottom navigator to adjust frequencies and adjust your navigation, whether or not you're adjusting your flight plan, putting in procedures, you can use that bottom screen as a keyboard. And with that cross functionality, you'll be able to adjust frequencies that show up on your top navigator with uh, crosstalk. And so that's a really yeah. cool thing. If you want a larger screen to be able to see what you're doing and nothing to kind of clutter to see, make sure that you're making the right changes, you have that ability. Yeah, and thanks, Stephen. I mean, if there's a theme that you are definitely going to hear tonight, it's flexibility. Flexibility with installation, flexibility with configuration, flexibility with how you fly it, uh, how you use it, every aspect of this. And, and that is why I am very passionate after having spent, you know, years uh, with this concept. Talk about intuitive operation. So we talked about talk, uh, data blocks, and then after this, we'll, we'll actually go through a, uh, a fairly rapid fire uh, demo of this so that we can actually uh, show you what, um, what we'll be doing. But if we start with the display itself, you can kind of break it up into different things. So we talked, we've got these blocks across the bottom, FMS, map, and auxiliary. Right now, we're looking at the uh, map side. And it starts with having these context-sensitive uh, uh, decluttering on your left, both for land and for NAT. And I think of this, uh, instead of just thinking of it as decluttering, I think of it as phases of flight. So think of yourself as, in this certain phase of flight, I want to see this type of information uh, or a certain type of flight. could be IFR versus VFR. It could be approach mode versus en route versus departure. There are different situations in how you want your screen to appear so that you have the most relevant information without data overload. So it's not confusing. It's as simple as possible. And that can be done through simple one-touch operation of those line selects that say land and nav. Very, very simple. Now you can put up a thumbnail of traffic if you choose, and then also you have these common nav blocks, and those can be configured as well. I, uh, as you'll see uh, in the demo, I happen to fly displaying uh, one active comm and two standby comms in the way that I fly, because I like to have all of that ready to go with one quick flip-flop to get in different uh, frequencies and have it right in front of me. You then have top data, and then you have um, that section on the right actually scrolls, and you can set up all sorts of data there, whatever you want to see. And that is a sliding pane. So if you look at where it says data, this is your map page, you tap on that, it just slides away. So it just pulls out and then slides away. The same type of thing you'll see over in FMS for your being able to look at your flight plan uh, when we actually do our demo. Okay, so at the beginning of the video here, the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at the decluttering feature. And I like to think of this, if we tap on the land in the left-hand section and the nav, I like to think this as much as phases of flight. So I don't use it just for decluttering. I use it as, let's look at this and think of it as a departure, approach, VFR flight versus IFR flight, etc. So this is very important and very customizable to what you do. In addition to that, if I tap 
tap on the data flag on the right hand side it pulls out this data tray and these are all customizable so again we talked about this customize it for the way that you like to fly and if you look at the upper left I have my comm fields I go with one active and two standby comms you tap on it you can type in a frequency you can dial in a frequency and all those data fields on your right you can scroll up and down lots of information the message here is highly highly customizable so let's start with our flight plan let's assume we're going to take a trip to Albany and the first thing that I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the Gardner VOR as the first point in my IFR departure of my IFR trip here now one of the most amazing features that are built into these navigators is the predictive nature of entering data I'm only going to touch G that's it, just G, and it already knows the Gardner VOR. I, I'll tell you, no matter where I fly, I found this to be absolutely amazing. It is incredibly predictive, sometimes only one letter, sometimes two letters, and it knows where you're going. And so the first point in our flight plan is in there, it's the Gardner VOR. Let's assume we're gonna use that as a launching point for an airway. All I need to do is tap. It knows that one of the options are airways, I look at that and I can actually see a preview of all of the different airways as I toggle down this list. And as you can see, both Victor 2 and Victor 14 actually look pretty similar if you're going to Albany. And so I can actually sit there and say, okay, well, let's uh, use Victor 2. And then it says, well, where do you want to exit the airway? And so I'm just going to go down this list and it will build the airway out from getting on at Gardner VOR. And then here I can see it. Do I want to get off at Warvu? Well, that's a little close to the airport. I think I want to get off at Grave. And then that's how I'll join the approach. So I click that, it's already built it. So now next last step here, I'm gonna go and say, put in my destination. Well, that's gonna be Albany. So uh, now again, you could have done this first, but in my case, I'm gonna do it last. All I had to do is type in A and L and poof, uh, it uh, already brought it up. It uh, preloaded the K as the airport. So here you can also see the color coding. I'm going direct to the Gardner VOR. My airway is there. It's currently expanded. You can collapse it. The airway is there in uh, the gray. And then uh, my destination you'll see at the bottom as well will be in blue. Now, let's say I'm issued a hold. Very simple again. I tap it. It just says, what do you want to do here? Do you want to hold? I said, yeah. I pick the most common hold that's already given to me. And then I can type in 360 if that's the direction I want to do the hold very quick I typed it in the hold is already built for me and it shows me my route there it shows me entering the hold I'm going along here I can even see a synthetic vision view of this I can click on the SVS and I can see in 3d this view of going into this hold really really interesting and so easy to use again very rapid fire what we're doing here but think of the complexity of what we're building we just took an, uh, uh, an entire route to a destination with a launching point at a VOR, an airway along the way. We put a hold in there already. Now we're sitting there, we're going to enter the hold. Now the simulator here is going to have a plane, some traffic come in in 3D. Traffic's going to like try to form up on me or something. Um, so let's ignore that for the moment. But in 3D, I'm looking at this hold. Now you get to start thinking about when do I want to exit the hold? So I can stay in the hold, but if I click on that FMS button to look at it, I, it gives me that option at any time of do I want to exit the hold, lower left hand corner of your screen. I can toggle that. I can click exit hold or I can click continue hold. And it'll give me that uh, option. We'll do that right after we make this turn. We'll turn around here this part. We'll start the inbound leg. Now your current leg is magenta. Your next leg is this kind of candy cane dash that you see here. As soon as I get onto this now, I can decide, well, what's the next thing? Right now, I click, uh, I, it's set up to exit the hold. If I click on that, then uh, it gives me this toggle for continue hold or exit hold. Back to my synthetic vision view. Now here I come in, I'm gonna make this turn and I'm going to exit this hold. So now it's time to start thinking about the rest of our trip and actually the arrival. So uh, here we go, we're gonna turn, we're gonna begin this last step of our journey. 
and I can see it here again in 3D. This is the, uh, the uh, equivalent of the 900. Well, now I'm going to look at approaches. I click on the procedure and all the approaches get previewed on the map again graphically drawn out. Where is this? So you can get an idea if you're hearing other people issued certain approaches or if you, you're told what to expect. I'm going to pick the RNAV 28 and then I can also click on vectors or I can see what the other options are. I'm going to pick vectors for this and really simplify it. So now what we have is a flight plan with a discontinuity. I am coming in here to grave. That is my exit point. And now I have this uh, approach that's hanging out there that I can activate. Once I get on that last segment, it's going to give me the option to activate that approach, which will replace my final segment and connect those two things. You see that little dash where VTF is in the upper, la upper right of your screen? That's a summary of my flight plan. That's the discontinuity. It's very graphically there. I could tap on it and delete it if I wanted to connect that, or I just wait and activate my vectors to final. It's very, very simple. Now we're going to use this opportunity to show you another feature and a really important feature of this product, and that is forward-looking terrain avoidance, FLTA. Now normally, of course, you'd never fly this low. We're doing it in the simulator just to show you this feature. Now you see the color coding. Most products charge enormous amounts of money to be able to have this uh, terrain avoidance, to have, you know, TAWS systems or similar. This comes with the product. Both in 3D and 2D, you have the ability of this forward-looking terrain avoidance, and that includes audio alerts as well. The alerts you see on the screen, the color coding that you see, and as well. Last step, it's time for the approach. We gonna click, we're going to click just on the chart button. We're going to look at the plan, we're going to look at the profile view, whatever I need, and of course the aircraft is on the chart. If you look, you see this teal box, that is my chart. That means I am now superimposed on the chart in that area, and so I can see it approaching. And when I look at the map itself, it's going to actually tell me what the step-down altitudes are. So again, very, very easy to use. Step-down at CMA to 2200 coming up, and then we're coming into runway 28. I can see that I can also see based on our terrain avoidance that there's a, a hill or some obstacle to my right that's in the caution range. And then as I come down here, this last segment, we're going to look in 3D. Now, of course, I don't normally swipe around like this in normal <laughs> IFR operations. But in this case, it just shows you all the different views you have at the click of a single button. I can click in here, look at it on the chart, look at it in synthetic vision look at it on my uh, regular chart view, my regular map view, as you can see there. And then the last step of this is I come in to the final part of this approach and we come in for landing. Again, one button, I take a look, I hit the chart button, and what it's going to do is it's just going to switch this now to the airport diagram with one button as we slow down on the runway and get ready for our turnoff. And that is a rapid fire, quick look at everything that you have with the Aero Nav system. Very, very impressive, incredibly easy to use, highly, highly customizable. Um, so, the flagship model when it comes down to our Aero Nav series is the Aero Nav 910. And what that adds is a built-in attitude reference system and what that gives you is not only an extra button that you get to brag to your friends about when they get into your cockpit but you get a out the window synthetic vision look now when i came from flying in north dakota i don't really have to worry about anything mountain wise flta is not a thing because if you had FLTA in North Dakota, it would just show flat. It, everything would be green because there's nothing really that you can hit other than maybe some cell towers and some wind turbines. But moving to Albuquerque, we're almost at a mile high here and there are mountains. So being able to see something that shows a dynamic view of where you sit in regards to the top of the mountain allows you to kind of plan some of your additional flight planning for mountain flying 
do you have the performance to get over the top if you get into a tough situation? If you don't have the performance, what are your other options? And so when you have a built-in attitude reference sensor, that gives you some of that additional kind of thought and situational awareness when you are flying in the mountains. And so that builds that terrain and obstacle avoidance as kind of a standard feature when you have the AeroNav 910. And that's the big difference in between the 900 and the 910 is that attitude reference sensor. But you're also gonna start to see other things. And as pilots, we all are very familiar with going on to aviationweather.gov, looking at the grand scheme of things, seeing if, you know, what airports are, IFR, VFR, MVFR, and that same sort of logic with those little METAR flags is reflected on these units. So through your synthetic vision, when you're zoomed out, you're going to see all those little METAR flags, which when you're picking an alternate or you're coming into an airport and you aren't sure if you're going to be able to punch through at 200 feet, it gives you the awareness and situational awareness that you have other options and you can see where the weather is best. And even past that, with uh, the fuel totalizer, if you do have one of those, you're going to see fuel rings on where you can make it. And the unit itself is building in that situational awareness where as pilots we learn that but this is just helping you synthesize some of that data on a very easy to read display and so that's the biggest thing when it comes to the attitude um, the built-in attitude and not to mention if you do have a legacy aircraft and you have some legacy instruments it gives you a, a almost a digital hsi like ladder at the bottom there with indicators to help you fly. So that's the biggest thing that you're gonna see with that flagship unit, the AeroNav 910. So Jeff and I have, we've talked about a lot of the open integration, and this is just to highlight some of those things. Um, ADSB traffic and weather, um, you're gonna be able to see that from a variety of transponders uh, coming out. If you're looking at a fuel totalizer, which I just talked about, JPI units, the EDM 700 and 760, those are going to um, give you a fuel totalizer and you're going to see this pretty green ring on where you can make it with a 45 minute reserve. That's a big thing when you're flight planning, in my opinion, when you're looking at options on where you're going to be able to land at an airport, anything along those lines. And then just other flight instruments, you have the integration with a huge array of data systems from XM, huge array of encoding transponders, the KEA uh, 130A, but a very common older legacy uh, Bendix King unit. You're gonna have that integration between a lot of that legacy stuff, which is just the ability of the actual AeroNav systems having all those inputs in between your RS-232 and your AirRank options. You're gonna have multiple traffic options. I mean, the list goes on. And so this is just a couple of the uh, examples to show some of the integration that stuff you probably already have in your cockpit can work to show additional features on an AeroNav unit. Yeah, and again, it's, it's, it, it's, the goal here is having an open future. The goal here is that not only what's in your aircraft today, but what you might see at the next show that you go to that you might plan on next and the idea that you can be confident that it will integrate with the AeroNav systems. Absolutely. And so I just kind of wanted to give everybody an idea of what you're looking at for pricing. And I wanted to break this out in between the unit itself and the train install kit, because guess what? If you already have a GNS 430 or 530 unit, you're gonna be saving yourself roughly about two grand less price on the prices here because you aren't gonna need those uh, because that's already there, that slide and replacement. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on here. Don't wanna give anybody sticker shock, but uh, that's just to give you an idea of some of the pricing that you can expect list price. Again, all of our dealers are gonna have their own pricing. Uh, when you see this so these prices definitely are going to be different across the board depending on who your preferred dealer is 
And Stephen, these are, just to be clear, uh, th these are the same list prices, whether it's Bendix King's uh, version with the uh, towards that complete cockpit feature or whether it's the Avenine one. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. And uh, just to give anybody the information that they need, uh, if you do have any additional questions on the AeroNav, uh, please feel free to email me. That is my personal work email. More than happy to talk to any of you guys uh, about any sort of the AeroNav products, or even if you just have any other questions about Bendix King. Um, now, for technical stuff, probably can't answer some of those integration questions if you are asking real technical ones. Um, but we do have a tech support team uh, based out of Albuquerque and Olathe that definitely would be happy to answer any of those questions. Uh, their number is at the bottom there, that 855-250-7027. Um, option three and then option seven is going to get you directly to AeroNav tech support. Um, so if you do have other Benix skin questions, option three is that tech support, and then just listen to the options if you have any other questions for Benix King. Definitely, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate your time as part of Social Flight's webinar series that we have. Uh, again, Stephen, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. It is exciting to see what can happen with putting all of these best-of-breed products together under the Benix King name and umbrella. And, and and combining it with AeroView Touch and, and seeing what this future holds. It's, it's very, very exciting stuff, and I really do appreciate everyone's time. So again, for Social Flight, I'm Jeff Simon. Blue skies, and thank you so much. Thank you from Benix King. Bye-bye.